So Daniel in the lion's den is one of the most familiar stories. Oh, yeah, okay, maybe that's it. <laughs> I'm used to going up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so he's considered one of the greatest heroes of the Bible. There's so many iconic stories. I'm sure you guys are familiar with all these. Uh, they were taken captive. They had to choose whether they're going to eat the king's meat or not. They faced the fiery furnace and then the lions, and then there's a handwriting on the wall. And so it's just a whole series of amazing stories. And from early in his life, Daniel faced many tests to help prepare him for what was coming. And the first test he faced was the siege of Jerusalem. And this was the third year of Jehoiakim. And this was the first time the Jews were deported to Babylon. And I'm sure Daniel had many questions like, why me? You know, like he had to be one of the first Jews to leave for Babylon. And he had to leave his friends and families. And another test he faced was he became a eunuch. And I'm sure that was... Not very pleasant. And it's interesting, the Bible says that, the Bible never specifically says Daniel became a eunuch. But we have a text in uh, Second Kings, and this is a prophecy made from, I think it was Isaiah to Hezekiah. And he said, And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you'll beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And another test he had to face was he was going to choose whether to eat the king's meat or not. And of course, we're facing many tests today like this, like keeping the Sabbath, paying tithes, and those are some little tests. And the Sabbath is something that I always feel like I could do a better job. It's easy to get distracted by social media or whatever. So one of the greatest trials Daniel ever faced happened after Persia was conquered in Babylon. And I wanted to show you guys a really cool painting I found on the internet. And you can see the handwriting on the walls on the far left and then on the right, you can see the seven golden candlesticks. And in the middle, you can see a guy with a dark robe, and that's Daniel. He's giving his apocalyptic prophecy. So that was pretty neat. And so in the grand scheme of events, the handwriting on the wall kind of represents the close of probation. And so today we're going to be studying more at the time of trouble, which happens after the close of probation, and that happens in Daniel 6. So if you guys have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Daniel 6 although we are going to have the verses up on the screen, a lot of them. But I'm going to wait a second. We're going to start with verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 3. And I guess the words are a little small. The last church I preached this sermon at, their PowerPoint was like 15 feet wide. So, <laughs> so in Daniel 6, 1 through 3, we read, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So everything must have seemed like it was going great for Daniel. And Bible times is pretty much unheard of. Can you imagine survive, being a ruler of one kingdom and surviving the shake-up to another? And so God was really with him. And if you read the story, if you read the story of Daniel before, you can tell he was a close friend and confidential of the king. And verse 3 said he had an excellent spirit. And I think it was a kind Christian attitude of Daniel that endeared him to the king. So what had just transpired was amazing. Daniel was witnessing for God in a foreign nation from one of the highest positions of power. And I'm sure Satan was very unhappy about this. And unfortunately, the other leaders in the Persian government are pretty mad too. So we go on to verse 4 and 5. It says, So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And that really shows kind of who Daniel was. They could find no fault in him. And we need to be godly like he was. Jesus says someday we'll stand before courts and hopefully they'll be able to say they can find no fault in us. And maybe they'll have to resort in using God's law against us too, or man's laws, I mean. So the leaders were very unhappy about Daniel's success, and they plotted to kill him. And I'm sure if you guys have been reading the news, it's just politics lately has been really full of bitter and hatred 
their bitterness and hatred had been awful. And that makes me think sometimes that the hatred the world has for each other is going to turn against us someday. And it's not going to be very pleasant, but we need to be getting ready for those days. And I have a couple of verses from Jesus I'd like to read about being hated by the world. In John 15, 18, Jesus says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And Jesus faced everything that we are facing now and will face in the future. And Luke 6.22 says, Blessed are you when men hate you, and, if they ex- and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. So that's kind of comforting to think that God will bless us someday if we're hated. So I have an interesting quote from a religious writer from the 1800s. She wrote, The spirit of persecution will not be excited against those who have no connection with God and have no moral strength. It will be aroused against the faithful ones who make no concession to the world and will not be swayed by its opinions, its favors, and its opposition. A religion that bears a living testimony in favor of holiness, that rebukes pride, selfishness, avarice, and fashionable sins will be hated by the world and by superficial Christians. (laughs) And right now I think there's many worldly issues dividing the church. And so... We just need to make sure not to let those issues come into our church. And then we can become more united. So getting back to Daniel, verses 6 through 9, says, So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom and the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish a decree and sign a writing so it cannot be changed according to the law of Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed a written decree. So, essentially, the king was kind of tricked into signing this law. They used his pride against him to condemn his friend Daniel, and that's how the devil works in a very sneaky, underhanded manner. And now we read in verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. And I think it's amazing. Like sometimes you hear there's a law, your first thought isn't, oh, I'm going to go break this law and get in big trouble. (laughs) But Daniel... That's where he talked to God. He was being a witness. And so he went home and he prayed. And he could have chosen to pray in his closet, but instead he decided to face Jerusalem, facing the broken down temple there, and he poured out his heart to the Lord. And keep in mind that Daniel knew he would, might be fed to a den full of hungry lions, and that's pretty scary. And I have a video clip I'm going to ask Ken to play really quick. I got it found on YouTube of some lions growling, <laughs> and maybe the kids will enjoy this. And they don't sound that ferocious, so maybe it kind of ruins things. But, <laughs> but to keep in mind, these are hungry, well-fed lions. So. <laughs> So kind of funny, I never knew lions sounded like that, that my wife said she's heard them before. So you can imagine lions being about 10 times hungrier than that, and being stuck down a den with them would be very unpleasant. So I guess today we have to ask ourselves, will we have the courage to act like Daniel did? And maybe we could make excuses. Oh, it's not a salvation issue, I can pray in my closet. And I think that's something that Christians tend to say if we want to try to avoid giving 100% of everything to God, our choices and our actions. You know, I was thinking about it. Jesus gave 100% of everything he had. He gave his life. He gave his blood. He gave everything for us. So I don't think we should hold back just in case we feel something might not, you know, be a salvation issue. 
And another lesson we can learn from Daniel 6.10 is when the worship crisis hits the Adventist church, we need to boldly witness for Jesus. So instead of becoming like this lady, a hermit, and crawling off into an off-the-grid shelter, we need to bravely stand for Christ in the last days. And I believe when the Sunday law comes, that doesn't mean hide in your house. That means to hit the streets and preach the gospel with even greater energy than before. So it's going to be an exciting time. So getting back to Daniel and verses 6 and 11, we read, Then these people assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the laws of Medes and Persians, which does not alter. And so I'm sure you guys know there's another law that doesn't change, and that would be God's law. And because God's law doesn't change, or we know he doesn't change, and so I have a couple of verses about God not changing. They're pretty significant. And in uh, he, or Malachi, it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. And in Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's got to be one of the most wonderful verses in the Bible. And, uh, you know, every time we break God's law, we're proving Satan's claim that God's law is unjust and impossible to keep. So we need to follow the example of Jesus by keeping the law. So getting back to Daniel, uh, verses, chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. (laughs) And sometimes I like to draw little Bible parallels. Remember when King Nebuchadnezzar was told the three Hebrews weren't bowing down? And he was extremely angry. (laughs) Well, this king had a completely different reaction. He kind of acted like Jesus would act. Jesus has been doing everything he can to save us. I'm sure he's been laboring day and night. And so I thought that was amazing that the king would do that for Daniel. Obviously, he cared a lot about Daniel. And I think in the context of the end time events, these men accusing Daniel represent Satan, and he's the accuser of the brethren. And Revelation 12.10 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come down. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And so there's many examples of Satan carrying out this role in the Bible um, when he was attacking Job's character. And also right now he's attacking us. He says we are not worthy to go to heaven. He says it's impossible for men to keep God's law. So coming back to Daniel, and this would be verse 16. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him back, or cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you served continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet of his lord, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. And right here it seems like Daniel has a lot of faith. I mean, the king has a lot of faith in Daniel's God. And it wasn't, the king didn't say it was his own personal God, but as Christians, I hope that someday when times get rough, our neighbors will come down the street and say, I have faith in your God. Then we can say, did you know he is your God as well? That would be wonderful. And and this story, I was reading this, and I was like, wow, this has some really cool similarities to another story found in Matthew. And I'm sure you guys know what happened after Jesus died. The Pharisees were worried the disciples would steal away Jesus' body. And that the second deception would be worse than the first. So I have a little quote from that. It was quite a long passage. I just got a little part from it. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way and make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So Satan really did everything he could to stop God from rescuing Jesus and Daniel. But against these stories, if you know the ending of these stories, I'm sure you do, that against God, Satan is absolutely nothing. He's powerless. So reading in Daniel 6.18, we read about the king's sleepless night. 
And he went to his palace and spent a night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. So he didn't really have the faith that Daniel did. Uh, he was worried about Daniel. And it was interesting. If you remember King Saul, he had music played for him when he was dressed out to cheer him up. But I just, I th- it feels like the king was kind of in mourning right now. He didn't really know, you know what happened to Daniel. So frankly, it sounds like the king had a worse night than Daniel did. The Bible doesn't say what Daniel did. Maybe he snuggled up to a lion or used him as a pillow. I don't know. And so in the morning, the king went looking for Daniel. And verses 19 and 20 say, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And so he had a lamenting voice. He wasn't very hopeful. And what happens next, I think, is one of the most powerful moments in biblical history. Pretty amazing. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, so they will have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, king, I have done no wrong before you. And so that's what an amazing witness. And the king, his faith seemed to be a little weak. I'm sure his faith grew about a mile after he heard Daniel speak. It was a miracle. And I don't know if you guys know, but I guess the name Daniel means God is my judge. And he could stand before the greatest king of the world at that time and say, I'm innocent. I haven't done anything wrong. And he could also stand innocent before God in heaven. And what if Daniel had a sinful habit he refused to give up? Would he have survived the lion's den experience? Well, Daniel said the reason he survived was because he was found innocent before God. And the godly life of Daniel represents another group of people who will stand before the king of the universe at the very end of time. And this group of people will be faultless and blameless. And Revelation 14, 3 to 5, we read, No one could learn that song except 144,000 who are redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who followed the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So just like Daniel, we need to live a godly life so we can face persecution and be a witness to God's glory. And I have uh, the next verse I consider one of the most difficult in the Bible to think about or talk about, but it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And personally, I can't think of anything more impossible than that, but I don't feel like God wants us to say that's impossible. He gave a command, and with Jesus' help, I think we should try to be more like Jesus. And it's kind of interesting. Jesus said, be perfect like my Father in heaven. He didn't say, be perfect like me. And Jesus was just so humble, he didn't point the finger at himself. But when you talk about perfection, it's really all about Jesus. He himself is perfection. And the only way we can become more like Jesus is to constantly just think about him throughout the day, trying to be more like him. So I'd like to share a really beautiful quote I found from one of my favorite writers. Might be a little small, but... The people of God are to turn every action into devotion. They are to partake of every meal as if they knew it was a token of love of the infinite God expressed to them. The termination of one duty is to be the commencement of the next that presents itself. Then the Christian character will be manifest into a life of continuous obedience and service to Jesus Christ. And that whole quote, it just it feels like it's talking about a life of purpose, really. And I believe we should live with a purpose to be more like Jesus, just like Daniel did. And I was doing some research, and I guess there's a couple different lions, or types of lions mentioned in the Bible. Satan is uh, portrayed as a lion. It says, be, or 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And so I'm sure you guys know what happened to the wicked men who accused Daniel. They were thrown into the lion's den, and they were eaten up before they hit the ground. And unfortunately, we might have a story like those men if we find ourselves in troublous times, and if we don't have a relationship with God we might find ourselves at the devil's mercy, and that wouldn't be very pleasant. And I have another quote. 
about another lion, or you think of the Lion of Judah, and I'm going to get to the more positive, pleasant stuff in just a second. <laughs> it says, the love of a holy God is an amazing principle which can stir the universe in our behalf during the hours of our probation and trial. But after the season of our probation, if we are found transgressors of God's law, the God of love will be found a minister of vengeance. God makes no compromise with sin. The disobedient will be punished. And so now I'd like to share some Bible verses with you guys about the time of trouble. And it's amazing, when I did a search for, you know, the Old Testament talks about the time of trouble. In the New Testament, they use the phrase tribulation. And I found so many verses that are just full of comfort and hope. It's like God didn't, you know, write this stuff to scare us. He didn't write this stuff to gratify our curiosity about how awful it's going to be. So the first... Oh, yeah, I have one more verse about the wicked in a time of trouble. It says, confidence in an unfaithful man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. <laughs> and I find that verse a little humorous, maybe. So, apologize, it might be a little small. But there's a passage from Isaiah 33, and verses 14 to 16. And it starts out by talking about what will happen to the wicked in the time of trouble. Then it transfers over to the righteous. And it's really a wonderful promise. And it says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions. Who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes who stops his ears from the hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. His place, he will dwell in high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him and his water will be sure. That's a wonderful promise. And it says right there, if you stop your ears from the hearing of bloodshed and shut your eyes from seeing evil. And when I read that, I'm like... <laughs> Oh, it'd be easy to make excuses, or I'm like, oh, that's talking about people back then, they fought battles, and they were in war, and killed each other, but for me personally, I'm like, I gotta be more careful about what I watch when I turn on the TV. So, if we are godly Christians, have faith like Daniel, he promises to be a refuge and strength, and give us bread and water. As we close, I would like to read a couple of beautiful promises from Psalms on how God will be with us during the time of trouble. The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, Psalms 9, 9 and 10. And Psalms 27, 5 says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in a secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. <laughs> And I had, uh, my friend went, he went to an Adventist church out in North Dakota, and out there it's just plains. And it's like, where are you going to hide? There's no mountains, there's no caves, you're, you know, it's not going to be very good. But I believe God can hide us anywhere. He can do anything. And so one more, Psalms 37, 39, and 40. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in a time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them, because they trust in him. So God gave us the story of Daniel to show us that if we live a godly life and have faith like Daniel did, that God will be with us through the time of trouble. And I just feel like that gives us a lot of hope and courage these 